I remember having a conversation with a friend of mine a couple of years ago. He wasn't a Christian, and I, um, I've got a pack of mints in my pocket, and they're rattling everywhere I walk, which is slightly frustrating. Uh, anyone wants a mint, just put your hand out, I'll chuck one at you. Uh, I, no. Um, <laughs> Greedy man, greedy man. Um, I remember a couple of years ago, I was talking to a friend of mine, not a Christian. I said, I thought oh, this would be interesting. I said to him, what do you think Christians believe about Easter? Now, I'd asked him the same question about Christmas, and he got that totally wrong. So I was uh, expecting a bit of a weird answer, like, you know, rabbits rolled away the stone or something <laughs> bizarre but uh, actually he got most of it right I was impressed he said on Good Friday Jesus died on a cross yes well done yeah, you've got something excellent he he was buried in a tomb excellent well done you've got another point people went back on the th- <laughs> was that slightly patronizing well done uh, people went back on the third day and they found Jesus wasn't there excellent well done and in his place was a giant egg <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea where he got that from. It must have been some, I don't know, old Cadbury's advertising campaign that I've missed out on or something. There was no egg in the tomb. I'm sorry to disappoint you. There were no bunnies rolling away stones or, or anything like that. Um, but he got most of the Easter story right. As Christians, we celebrate Easter. We believe it's a big and important time. And, uh, and most of that story is factually accurate. Jesus, we believe, died on a cross. He had an unfair trial. He was beaten. He was tortured. He was put to death, an agonizing death. Death. He was put in a tomb, and then on the third day, a bunch of women went back to the tomb. They had a look in there, expecting to find the body, going to anoint it with spices, and they found the body wasn't there. And not only that, beyond that point, over the coming days and weeks, many people claimed to have actually seen Jesus alive and walking around. So that Paul, one of the earliest Christian writers in 1 Corinthians 15, he lists all these people who have actually seen Jesus. And at one point he says, Jesus appeared to over 500 in one go. Not only was there an empty tomb, but people also claim to have seen the risen Jesus. And this is why we take Easter so seriously as Christians. And we're going to look at a little passage today. I'm going to read it from the Bible. If you don't have Bibles, it will appear on the screen. We're going to read that. I'm going to draw out a few points and, uh, and think what it has to teach us about Easter. So it's from Luke 24 and starting at verse 13. And it says this. That very day, two of them, that is two of the disciples, were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were walking with each other, uh, sorry, and they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what is this conversation that you are holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still looking sad. Then one of them named Cleopas answered him, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? And he said to them, What things? And they said to him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things happened. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning, and when they did not find his body, they came back saying that they had even seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. And he, that is Jesus, said to them, O foolish ones and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So they drew near to the village to which they were going. He acted as if he were going farther, but they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, for it is towards evening and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took the bread and he blessed and he broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened up to us the scriptures? And they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem. And they found the eleven and those who were with them gathered together, saying, the Lord has risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he was made known to them in the breaking of the bread. Okay. 
It's a long stretch of the story, but we see essentially three stages to the disciples' experience. They start off, they're downcast, they've got no sense of hope, they're upset, they're kind of resigned to the fact Jesus is dead, we thought he was going to amount to something more, but there he is, he's in his tomb, that's it, game over. They are resigned to the fact that Jesus is dead, and then Jesus himself comes along and speaks to them, explains things to them, instructs them, educates them, says, actually, you need a bit of teaching on this so you can understand it better. They still don't recognize him then they go into the house they start having a meal and suddenly it says their eyes were opened that doesn't mean they walked along the entire seven miles with their eyes closed the whole time Uh, that would make sense why they didn't recognize Jesus but it's it's a metaphor it's saying that suddenly at that moment they got revelation and they understood that Jesus was amongst them three things we see resignation they're resigned to the fact that Jesus is dead re-education Jesus gets alongside them he teaches them he explains things to them in a new way and then revelation it clicks into place the penny drops and they finally understand and those are the three things that we are going to look at this morning so resignation these guys did not expect Jesus to come back from the dead okay they weren't waiting for the third day going come on come on he's going to come back from the dead they didn't get it They thought he was dead, gone, buried, that's it, end of story. In fact, if you read back earlier in the passage, you find that's exactly the same as the women. The women are going to the tomb to anoint Jesus' body with these spices. They're totally resigned to the fact Jesus is dead and he's not coming back. They weren't going with this blend of spices thinking, you know what, when he gets out of there, he's going to want to smell fresh, so we rub these on him. It wasn't like that. It wasn't some primitive recipe for links or whatever. It was these spices were the things that stopped you rotting when you were dead. They were under no illusions. Jesus was dead. In fact, if you read through the Gospels, you find about three or four times Jesus speaks openly about his death and his coming resurrection, and it says the disciples just didn't get it. It says either they were confused but too scared to ask, or they were really sad, presumably they didn't understand the resurrection bit. They just didn't get it at all. They weren't expecting Jesus to come back from the dead. In fact, these guys, they're walking along, they say this, he was a prophet, they're talking about Jesus, he was a prophet, mighty in word and deed, but he was put to death. They say this phrase, but we had hoped, we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. They pinned all their hopes on Jesus. He's going to be the one that rescues us. He's going to be the one that changes history. He's going to be the one that releases us from being ruled over by the Romans. We had hopes. They pinned all their hopes on him. But clearly now he's dead. He's failed. He's in the grave. He can't have been the person we thought he was. What do you make of Jesus? See, I think a lot of people still think Jesus is dead. Even a lot of people who go to church, who celebrate Easter, they really still think that Jesus is dead. Or they act as if he is. I was having a conversation with a guy the other day. I was saying, what do you think of Jesus? The things he said, the, the life he lived. He said, well, I think Jesus was a good moral teacher, a nice guy, but you know, I can't believe that resurrection bit. To him, Jesus was no different than any other good moral teacher throughout history. Gandhi or or Socrates or Plato or whoever, a philosopher who said good things, maybe even did good things, but now he's just dead in the grave. Is that what you make of Jesus this morning? I want to challenge you. There is good proof for the resurrection of Jesus. We don't have time to get into it now. Come and see me. I'll offer you books and um, I'll talk at you for hours about the resurrection of Jesus if you want, which I can't imagine you would want. But I believe that Jesus was raised from the dead. And if he was raised from the dead, that changes everything. But these guys were resigned to the fact Jesus is in the grave. He's not coming back from there. End of story. We'd hoped he was going to save us. We were clearly wrong. And then Jesus himself gets alongside them and he explains things to them in a new way, this kind of re-education. He said, no, actually, you've believed this, you've understood this, but you haven't quite got it. Let me explain Jesus' death to you in a new way so that hopefully you will understand it. He tells them a story. Look at what he says. Oh, foolish ones and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. It's that curious word. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer and die? He didn't say, was it not inevitable, given the things that he said and the people he annoyed? Was it just not inevitable he was going to die? He says, was it not necessary 
that Jesus was going to die. In other words, was his death not required? Was it not planned in order to achieve something? See, what Jesus does is he, he takes this abstract concept of this dead guy and he draws it back into a story. I was talking to a teacher who was explaining to me how you teach maths to kids. It, it blows my mind how people can go from having no understanding of maths and, and they're, then they're able to be taught how to work out difficult sums. I can't get it. And this person said, well, actually, if you try and teach them an abstract concept like 4 times 32, you just give them this problem, they've got no frame of reference for understanding it. What you have to do is draw them back into a story and give them a story for understanding it. So you might say to a child, imagine you go to a shop and, uh, and there's some chocolate bars there and you buy four chocolate bars and each one of them costs 32 pence. How much do you owe? How much money do you have to give? And they go for 32 and 32 and 32 and 32 and they piece it together and by putting it into a story it turns that abstract principle they can't get their heads around into something they can understand it gives them a frame of reference for working it out it's 128 by the way in case you <laughs> you think yeah it is <laughs> that would have been well embarrassing than <laughs> well, the maths teachers would have just been I don't know. <laughs> but Jesus here he's given them this abstract principle the death of Jesus, and he takes it and he puts it into a story so that they can try and get their heads around it. He gives them a frame of reference for understanding it. And actually, the story he tells is a pretty ancient story. It's a story that's been going on for about 4,000 years at this point. He takes them to Moses and the prophets, which means basically he takes them through this entire first half of the Bible. He wouldn't have had a Bible with him. But, um, but he would have taken him through all this story. And he said, this is the story so far. Let me explain to you how the death of Jesus fits here at this turning point of the story. Let me show you how it's not only inevitable, but it's necessary to achieve this second half of the story. And Jesus takes this abstract principle of the death and he puts it into the context of this story so that the people can understand it. That's what we're going to do now. In about 10 minutes' time, no, not in about 10 minutes' time, over the next 10 minutes, I'm going to try and tell you this entire story very quickly. <laughs> there are a lot of themes in the Old Testament, in the early part of this story, loads of themes that we won't be able to draw out now. I imagine Jesus had a, a lot more time than I did and probably did a far better job than I'm about to. But we're going to just show you a couple of themes from this first half of the Bible, from this story so far, that make it clear why it was not only inevitable, but necessary that Jesus had to die. What's the first thing that happens in the Bible? Creation. Creation. God creates. God creates everything. He creates the universe. He creates the planet. He creates people. He creates fish and hippos and um, grass and all sorts of things, clouds and the ozone layer and all that stuff. He creates it and it's perfect absolutely perfect there's not one thing wrong with it at all what is the best thing he creates man not Cadbury's cream eggs man the best thing he creates he looks at everything he says that's good that's good that's good he creates man he says that's very good it's the pinnacle of his creation the best thing he's ever created by man I mean man and woman mankind together the best thing he's created. And actually, he gives mankind a task. He says, you are to rule over this world that I've created, this perfect world. You are to rule over it and be like my ambassador to this world. And actually, he tells man, you're going to spread. You're going to have lots of other little men and, and women. And you're going to spread over the whole world and be like my ambassadors to this world. You're going to be my representative, my perfect rulers over this planet. And then very, very early on in the story, we see something that Christians call the fall. The fall. And what that means is this. Man was created to be something great, to be a ruler. And actually they sinned. That means they were disobedient against God. And they became less than they were meant to be. Less than they were intended to be. Basically, God created this enormous garden. He said, you can eat anything from any of the trees except this one. And look, at, I mean, tons of trees. All good, just not that one. <laughs> what did mankind do? They ate from the one. They disobeyed God. And when Christians talk about sin, that's basically what it means. It means disobeying God, just choosing your own way. And there was a result of that disobedience, and it's death. Up until this point, all of creation and mankind were perfect. There was no hint of corrosion or corruption at all. But because of man's disobedience, death 
came into the world. This the story. This is just the first few chapters of the story. Don't worry, I'm going to get faster. <laughs> I'm not going to go at this speed all the way through 800 pages. Don't worry. But death came into the world, and not just to human beings, but to all of creation that man was meant to be ruling over. And so everything from that point, hippos and fish and the ozone layer and grass and trees and man, all descended into this downward spiral of corruption, becoming worse and worse and worse and worse. The story goes on for a little while. All sorts of things happen. People go into slavery. They get released. All sorts of stuff. They cannot stop disobeying God. This is the story of the Old Testament. They keep on disobeying God again and again and again. And so God says, well, here's a a system for you. He introduces something called sacrifice. And he says, basically, someone's got to get punished for the disobedient things that you do. That's the way law works, right? Even in our world, that's the way things happen. You do something wrong, the judge can't just go, I'll sweep it under the carpet. You have to pay the price for what you've done. And God said, very early on in the story, he said, here's a way that you can take a perfect animal, and if you kill that animal, I will take the animal's death as payment for the disobedient things that you have done. Does that make sense? He says, I will look upon the death of the animal as if it were your death. I will look upon the animal's blood shed as if it was yours. So you can be forgiven for your disobedience. This is the story so far. And then from then on, for thousands of years, we see this ongoing cycle of people being disobedient and sacrificing and still being disobedient. And man cannot be good at all for thousands of years. Just this ongoing cycle of sin and disobedience and slavery and death and and more sin and more disobedience and sacrifice and slavery and death. This ongoing, repeating cycle, totally repetitive, no way of getting out of it. What you need is someone that can break that cycle. Because the story's ground to a halt. The story's ground to a point where everyone is just being wicked and disobeying God all the time. It's not going anywhere. Stories are meant to have happy endings, but there is no happy ending because they've just got down into this repetitive cycle of sin and slavery and death and sacrifice and failure and more disobedience and more sin and more sacrifice and more death and failure. The only way to break the story is if you can have a perfect man Someone who achieves what Adam was meant to be. Someone who lives a totally perfect life, never disobeying God once. And a perfect sacrifice. A sacrifice that could take the punishment and make payment for everyone's disobedience ever. That's what's necessary. That's what's required to get this story going again. The story is ground to a halt, like the boring bit in the middle of a long film where you just think, oh, come on, is this ever going to end? It's like that. You read the Old Testament, you think, gosh, is this ever going to end? It's just people beating each other up and dying and being evil and wicked and, and nothing seems to be happening and there's no hint of a happy ending in sight. What you need, what is necessary is a perfect man and a perfect sacrifice. And as Jesus tells this story to people, he's building to the point where he he is able to say, my death was a death as a perfect man, as a perfect sacrifice, so that I can get the story going again towards its natural, happy conclusion. Does that make sense? Sort of. (laughs) You're not convinced. Okay. (laughs) Read the Old Testament. Read the Old Testament. Think about it. Think about how hopeless it was. And then think about Jesus' death. Jesus' death was not only inevitable, it was necessary to get the story going again towards its happy conclusion. Jesus' death was the turning point in all of history, whereby this this downward spiral was suddenly changed. And through Jesus' death on our behalf, we can now get rid of, we can be forgiven for our disobedience against God. And actually, now as the perfect man ruling over all of creation, he's going to do something to put it right again. We're not going to continue on this downward spiral. We're not even going to stop at how we currently are. When Jesus was raised from the dead, he was made ruler over all of creation. Like man was meant to be at the beginning, Jesus became ruler over all of creation. And now his promise is that he is going to put it back together again. He is going to put it back together again. 
so that he can build it to being like God intended in the beginning, a perfect, glorious, wonderful place. And if you read through the rest of the story, you find that the happy ending is this. One day, God is going to recreate this world, and it's going to be a glorious place with no corruption, no sin, no suffering, no death, nothing like that. It's going to be a glorious physical place. A wonderful place where hippos look great and don't die. (laughs) And where we will have new bodies and we won't die. And we'll spend eternity with God in a perfect universe. We like happy endings, right? We like stories with happy endings. This is the happy ending. Because of the death of Jesus, we can do away with our past. All of our failures, all our disobedience is gone. Because of the resurrection of Jesus, we know that his new world order has started. He is ruling as the perfect man and he is going to put this world together again. And one day we are going to be able to spend eternity in a perfect world with God. If you believe in Jesus. Is that exciting? Partly. (laughs) I love stories with happy endings. I hate films where you get to the end and you think, come on, something nice happened, and then the lead character gets shot in the head or something. It's just a big disappointment, isn't it? You, you like things to turn out right, but actually the best kind of films are not the ones where loads of bad stuff happens and then everyone gets happy in the end and there just doesn't seem to be any link. Those are kind of just annoying stories where everything's miserable and suddenly it's happy. I think the best kind of stories are the kind of ones where lots of bad stuff happens, because I like bad stuff because it's fun to watch explosions on TV and stuff like that. All the bad stuff happens, but actually it comes together to bring about the good ending. All of the negative things that happen throughout the film kind of come together to be the means of bringing about the happy ending. Those are the best kinds of stories. Has anyone seen Signs? The film Signs? Hand up if you've seen Signs, come on. A few people. Okay, it's got Mel Gibson in it uh, and aliens. And um, I was thinking of showing a clip this morning, but I thought that'd be a bit weird to show aliens on Easter Sunday, um, lest you think they're part of the Easter story. They're not. Um, uh, if you haven't seen it, I'm about to ruin it for you, but to be honest, it's not that great anyway. So, <laughs> And it's been a few years, so you haven't missed out on much. But basically, the story of Signs is this. You've got Mel Gibson. He plays a priest who's lost his faith uh, due to a number of bad things that have happened in his life, mainly the death of his wife, who died in a horrendous car accident. To add to that, his youngest son has severe asthma. He can barely do anything without having an asthma attack. His daughter has got this kind of OCD tendency where she she leaves half-drunk glasses of water all around the house, which bizarrely enough my wife does as well, Um, which if you've seen the film, may be helpful to me one day if aliens attack. Um, (laughs) She leaves these half-drunk glasses of water all over the... Seriously, if you've ever had us around for dinner and you found a glass like behind books on a bookshelf or something, that's probably my wife. She just leaves them in random places. Bizarre, but irrelevant. Uh, And his... Uh, His younger brother as well was a baseball player, never really made it big because he had this annoying habit of swinging at every pitch that came at him, whether it was worth it or not. So he never really made it as a baseball player. All these negative things come together and to top it all off, as if that wasn't bad enough, aliens attack. Um, Oh no. (laughs) Uh, As if it wasn't bad enough. And they specifically attack his farm. Of all places in the world, they come to his farm. And there's this scene towards the end of the film where Mel Gibson's son has been taken captive by this weird alien and he's kind of holding him like (laughs) this weird (laughs) you like the impressions I'm getting that I'll do more impressions as we go along just to kind of keep you engaged (laughs) Uh, the the alien's holding this child and Mel Gibson's thinking what on earth's going to happen you think all these negative things have happened how's there going to be any good ending and Mel Gibson in his mind he remembers the death of his wife and the final words that she said and she said to him tell Meryl it's his brother. Tell Meryl to swing away. Don't let anyone judge him for the way he plays baseball. Just tell him to swing away. Weird things to say as you're about to die, but there we go. And he thinks, this can't be a coincidence. This comes to his mind. And so he says to Meryl, swing away, Meryl. It's very cheesy. He picks up this bat. He charges at the alien. He starts pounding the alien with this bat. The alien releases this toxic poison into Morgan, the son's face, and he has an asthma attack, therefore doesn't breathe in any of the poison. And suddenly, for no apparent reason, they realize, oh no, these aliens can't stand water, which is a bit stupid, seeing as most of our planet's made up of water. Why they came here in the first place, I don't know. But they look around and they've got all these glasses of water and they go, I know, we're going to smash the water with this bat. It's going to go over the alien and the alien, like the munchkins of Wizard of Oz, is like... And sort of dies as this, uh, you like that, I'll do it again. 
um, dies as the water uh, is splashed all over him. And so you see all these negative things. The asthma stops the boy dying. The OCD tendencies where you leave glasses of water actually becomes a means of defeating the alien. All these negative things kind of come together to bring about the happy ending. And the reason why I told you that slightly weird story, <laughs> I can see you're wondering, <laughs> is because with the death of Jesus, you look at a, a heck of a lot of horrendous things that happened to him. He was persecuted. He had a crown of thorns shoved on his head. He was beaten with whips that tore his back to pieces. He was tried unfairly. He was put to death on a cross. And you think that is a lot of negative things. No aliens, but a lot of negative things happen. He dies a horrendous death on the cross. And all those negative things together actually bring about the happy ending. Jesus' death was necessary to bring about the happy ending. In the, in the film, it's actually the death of his wife that triggers that, that train of thought, that triggers that process. Remembering the dying wife's words actually brings about the happy ending. And Graham, the character in the film, he, he leaves us with this sort of haunting question. He says there are two kinds of people in this world, the kind that believe in signs and miracles and the kind that just see coincidences. Which are you? Which are you this morning? Are you the kind of person who looks at the death of Jesus and thinks, it's inevitable really. I mean, he said some things that annoyed people. It's, you know, that's it. Or do you look at the death of Jesus and think there's something more? There's a significance to it. It was not only inevitable, it was necessary. It was the turning point in God's great story. Do you look at the death of Jesus and think, you know, it just, just happened, but... There's nothing more to it. Or do you look and see the deeper significance of the death of Jesus? I want to challenge you, if you've never thought about why Jesus died before, to think about it in the light of the whole story of the Bible. It wasn't just that he annoyed a few people. It's that he was God's plan to turn around this story, to bring about the great happy ending that you and I can be forgiven for our disobedience and can have the promise of a new life forever with God. I mean, that's a better happy ending than science, to be honest. The aliens just shrivel up and die, and that's about it. Here, death gets defeated. In the Bible, death gets defeated. Our great enemy, death, is left utterly powerless. Can't hold Jesus anymore. Can't hold us anymore. We get the promise that one day we are going to spend eternity with God. That's better than a few aliens shriveling up. <laughs> that is the ultimate happy ending. And Jesus explains this, probably without an alien analogy, but he, he goes through the whole Bible. He explains how his death was necessary to get the story going again. But they still don't kind of get it. They still don't get that this is Jesus talking to them. They might understand things in a new light. They've gone from resignation to kind of re-education, but they haven't yet got the revelation. Read what it says in the passage. So they drew near to the village to which they were going. He, that is Jesus, acted as if he were going further, but they urged him strongly, saying, stay with us, for it is towards evening and the day is now far spent. So Jesus went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took the bread and he blessed and he broke it and he gave it to them. And their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened, us, opened to us the scriptures? Their eyes were opened. They'd already been re-educated. They'd already had new facts put to them. The story told to them in a new way. They probably got it up here, but until this point, they hadn't got it in here. Christianity is not just about knowledge in your head. Education is great. Understanding things is great, absolutely. But you've got to know it here and here. You've got to encounter Jesus as well. And these guys, they had walked with Jesus, they'd had him teach them for quite some time, and they still hadn't quite figured out that this was him. They hadn't really grasped the significance of the fact that Jesus was with them, until he does this odd thing. He breaks some bread. Now, if I broke some bread, you're probably not going to go, whoa, he's God, <laughs> um, because anyone can break bread. But there was a kind of significance to Jesus breaking the bread, and it was this. Just a few days previously, the disciples and Jesus had had together what is known as the Last Supper, their final meal together before Jesus went to the cross. And he, during the supper, he took some bread and he broke it into pieces and he gave it to everyone and he said, this is my body. 
Now, if I did that to you, you'd probably think I was nuts. You say, no, it isn't. It's a malted loaf from Tesco or something like that. You, you, you just say, what are you talking about? But Jesus was handing it out and saying, this is what is going to happen at the cross. My body is going to be broken for each of you. And they must have thought, it's a bit weird, <laughs> okay, but, you know, I'll eat the bread. I like bread. Uh, and then Jesus takes the wine and he hands it out and he says, this is my blood given for you. He said, this is symbolic of what's going to happen at the cross. My blood is going to be shed for you. And they must have been thinking that's a bit odd and gross, but I like wine, I'll drink the wine. So they took the wine, but it didn't really make sense to them. But now, Jesus does exactly the same thing again. He takes the bread, having explained the whole story from beginning to this point, he takes the bread and he breaks it, and the penny drops. They get it. For the first time, they realize, hang on, this is what Jesus has been talking about the whole time. In fact, this is what the whole story of history has been talking about all time. The fact that there needed to be a perfect sacrifice. That Jesus' body had to be broken for us. And even though they had understood the facts at this point, they hadn't got it. They hadn't personalized it. They hadn't realized Jesus did this for us. In this moment, It all clicked into place. Jesus broke the bread and they realized this is Jesus amongst us. Have you ever had a moment in your life when you've gone from just knowing facts about Christianity to actually meeting Jesus? Have you ever had a moment in your life where you thought, okay, I kind of get Christianity, but I don't see how it's relevant for me. And then suddenly it clicks and it makes sense. That's what happens to these guys here. They'd walked along the road, they got the facts, but they hadn't met Jesus until this point. In fact, they'd said, didn't our hearts burn as Jesus explained the scriptures to them? They'd even got excited about learning. You can know a lot about Christianity. You can know all the facts. You can be able to explain the Easter story better than I can. You can even get excited about it so that your heart burns. But if you haven't met Jesus yet, that's not enough. We mustn't stop short of revelation. I think a lot of people, they go from being resigned to the fact that Jesus is in the grave and they're saying he's probably dead. And then they get the gospel, the good news explained to them and they think, okay, yeah, he's probably alive. But they very often don't make that third step to actually meeting Jesus. And I want to encourage you today. Don't see Jesus as some dead, good teacher. He was a good teacher, but he was more than that. In fact, he claimed to be more than that. He claimed to be God and he claimed that he would come back from the dead. If he's still in the tomb, those things aren't true. And if those things aren't true, why should we listen to anything he said? But actually, Jesus has raised from the dead. And you need to grapple with that. You need to go through an education process. You need to think, how, how do I understand? What do I understand about the death of Jesus? You need to probably ask questions, maybe read books, really get your head around it. But don't stop there. You need to meet Jesus. You need to encounter Jesus. And I want you to notice this. These guys could well have missed out on that opportunity. Read what it says. So they drew near to the village to which they were going. Then Jesus acted as if he were going farther, but they urged him strongly saying, stay with us for it is towards evening and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. It's this critical moment of the story where Jesus has explained things. They get the facts. They understand. And then Jesus says, right, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to keep on going. I think, to be honest, Jesus was trying to blag a free lunch here. He's saying, I'm going, to, I'm going to keep going unless you want to invite me in kind of thing. And they go, mm, okay, come on in. They had an option at that moment. They could have just said to Jesus, well, thank you for all you've explained. Have a great journey. I'll mull it over. Um, give it a little thought. Or they could invite Jesus in. Jesus could well have walked on by and they would never have known that it was him that was speaking to them that day. And I want to challenge you. What are you going to do this Easter with the facts of the death and the resurrection of Jesus? Are you going to say, thank you. I'll think about that. I'll mull it over. Uh, I'll give it some careful consideration and maybe come back to it another time. Were well, you going to recognize that Jesus himself may be wanting to reveal himself to you today? He may be standing at the door saying, I'm, I'm going to keep going unless you want to hang out with me some more. And if you're not a Christian today, you've got a critical choice to make. 
do you say to Jesus, I'll think about it? Or do you say, actually, come on in. I want to invite you in. I want to get to know you more. Don't let Jesus walk on by this morning. Jesus offers you today the chance to have all of your disobedience paid for and done away. The promise of an eternity spent with God. Don't let him walk on by today. I'm not saying this is the only chance you'll ever get to respond. I'm not saying that at all, but I might never see you again. It might be the only chance I ever have to give you an opportunity to respond. So I want to urge you, do not let Jesus walk on by today. If you're not a Christian, that can change today. You can get that happy ending of the story promised to you today. Eternity spent with God. In just a moment, we're going to sing um, some more songs. We're going to celebrate. They're going to be lively songs because we're excited about what's happened. It's not a morbid story. It's a happy story. And we're going to sing and celebrate. And actually, we're going to do what Jesus did with these guys. We're going to take some bread and we're going to break it. And we're going to pass it around. And we're each going to take a bit of bread and then we're going to pass around some juice. And we're going to drink that. And as we do it, we're going to be remembering the significance of Jesus' death and his resurrection. We're going to get excited about it if we're Christians here because it is the turning point in all of history. And so I'd encourage you to enjoy this, get stuck in. If you're not a Christian, I'm just going to give you an opportunity to think about whether you today want to invite Jesus into your life. So if everyone would just close their eyes, if the band would come up and start playing With every eye closed in this place today, no one's watching it except me and ultimately, of course, God. I recognize that you may have many questions. You may have a lot of things you still need to understand about Christianity. Like I say, come and talk to us about it. We'll try and explain more the best we can. We've got a team of guys on hand to try and answer questions and help and pray for you. But I want to give you the opportunity today, if you know that you have never personalized your understanding, if you've understood the death of Jesus, but you've never said, actually, I recognize that I need Jesus' death to pay for my disobedience, to get rid of my disobedience, and to give me personally the hope of eternal life with God. If you've never done that, then I encourage you, right now, why don't you just put your hand in the air, signifying that you want to make a response that you want to invite Jesus in and get to know him today. Just put your hand in the air if that's you. Maybe there are some people here today who are Christians. They, they, They get Christianity. They understand it. They feel like they know it. But actually, they've never met Jesus Maybe you know all the facts. You've been to a ton of Easter services. You feel like you get the story, but you've never actually met with Jesus. I'd encourage you, put your hand in the, in the air today. You can get to know Jesus. We can pray for you. Invite Jesus in. You can have that moment where your eyes are opened. You suddenly realize the significance of Jesus' death and his resurrection for you. And you can have the promise of eternal life. If that's you, just pop your hand up right now. Okay, thank you. We're going to sing. We're going to celebrate. We're going to pass around the bread. We're going to pass around the juice. We're going to get excited as we remember and celebrate and get excited about the death and the resurrection of Jesus. Let's stand up. Let's not teach, to treat this as a, a morbid, somber time. It's right to be somber remembering the death of Jesus, but remember the resurrection as well, the happy turning point in the story. I'm just going to pray, and then we're going to share the bread and the wine, and we're going to sing, and we're going to celebrate. Lord Jesus, I thank you for your death. 
It seems a bizarre thing to say. I thank you for your death, but I know that without it, I would have no hope. I thank you that you died so that I could be forgiven. You died in my place so that I could have the promise of eternal life. And I pray right now that you would help us to enjoy celebrating your death and your resurrection. I pray for my friends here today who don't know you yet, that their eyes would be opened just like the disciples' eyes were open. I pray that we would get excited and we would never stop being excited by your death and your resurrection. The most climactic moment in history when one man died so that everyone else could live. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Amen.